The Heart of David is back. Not only do we have the old classic selection, but we got a new drop called Pray for Your Friends. The number one important thing God wants us to do is love thy God with all of your heart, but the second one is love thy neighbor. The best way that you can love them is to pray for them. This is my new favorite t-shirt. Church boy right here, and look at the back. Very clean, very nice. I'm not gonna lie, I never really wear like white or cream style hoodies, but this is just a vibe, dude. This is like, hey, how you doing? I like you, and I know you like me, because I look good. If you liked any of these options, make sure you guys go to theheartofdavid.co or click the link in my description. I love you guys. Make sure you get it before it's too late, and it's gone, and like the sun, it's going away. Hurry up. It might be hard for the audience to understand this because when you're in show business, they don't see the joke when you're building it, they see the joke when it's ready to go. But with those jokes come the actual real pain that you go through. How do you deal with it? Cry? Uh, <laughs> drink? Really? <laughs> you, you you find ways to, to deal. But that can't be healthy. It can't, and it's not. Did you catch yourself drinking a lot because of that? Yes. Still, I still deal with the situation of people coming into my life and people leaving my life. A lot of relationships are affected because we do this. And if you're not careful, it, you know, people do get hurt. I'm just playing, I don't fight, I do not pray. I only go the way of Mr. Yahweh. It's not often I sit down with somebody and they say something that makes me think. Bro, this was great. I love you guys. <laughs> but you give me something to think about. My own damn way. I had a lot of fun on this interview. You should just have a show called Before We Get Started, and then every like five minutes say, listen, before we get started, I just want you to, and it's just an ongoing thing, keep going, keep going with it, before and, and it's like, it's the best conversation ever, I know what you mean, man, hey, listen, uh, so before we get started, <laughs> you just keep, keep going over and over. Uh, all right, here we go, you roll? Okay, what's up guys? Welcome back. Today I have a, um, a, an amazing guest. I'm actually very, very excited. We've worked together on Impulsive, but I am really excited because recently I just watched you, uh, you did like a, like a surprise visit for Joe Coy's show and he was performing at the Forum. By the way, you walked into a stadium like it was like a club full of 50 people. Like the confidence that you walk into a stadium is insane. But I called Bell like immediately right when I was done watching you because... When you walked out, that was, is, the forum has like 16,000 people in there, but it was the first time I actually felt the ground shake type of movement. Like people were losing their minds that you showed up. My first question is, going from being inspired by Eddie Murphy and then going to walking on as a guest to somebody else's arena, but having them shake from excitement, like what does that do to your heart? Do you still feel that when you walk out? Does it, it? Oh, for sure. It's 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 an awesome feeling, and it's uh, one of my favorite things to do is is crash a show, mm -hmm. because it's it, for me that's more that's more fun. It's it's more exciting. It's like oh my god, look who's here! It's that feeling times a thousand. Mm. So it's like you know, it's like showing up at a at a family reunion or somebody's house that like people that know you, and and you, you know hey hey look who's here. It's it's literally hey look who's here and it's but magnified like it just it, it's it's literally you know an arena full of people like oh my god it's him mm -hmm. and so that for me is such an awesome feeling that's uh, don't get me wrong when I, when when I do my shows it's you know it's my shows are my shows but they know I'm coming but that extra surprise oh man that feels great it's like that's the a, biggest surprise party ever yes it's like <laughs> oh shit yeah, yeah. you know look like at him. <laughs> So that for me, that for me, I love, that's why I love, uh, you know, popping in on shows and stuff like that. It's just, that's you know, so that, that's fun. how I get my, like, like, hey, this is fun. All right, cool. And it's not a, and it's not a money thing. You know, it, when you, uh, when you're doing a guest spot, it's not a, a thing where you're trying to get paid. It's just, hey, you know, come on in and, and hang out and have fun. And it's literally having fun. So to walk out and, and have people react like that, that's awesome feeling. Do you feel like you do your best performances when there's a surprise because there's less pressure and so you're kind of coming in into it like as a this is a fun experience that's kind of no you know no pressure if I disappoint anybody and and then you get that response so it gives you that extra confidence. There is literally no pressure and all it is it's just bliss it's just like it, you're getting hit with everything and I'm only doing a few minutes so I don't have to do you know an hour hour and a half two hours it's literally 10 literally 10 to 15 minutes and it's just, it just came by to say hi. Yeah, so yeah com comics <laughs> you know? work out that way. They, they work out their material. Are you working out new material when you do that? Or are you coming in with your best? Uh, well, I don't wanna, I don't, I don't wanna practice on 16,000 people. So if, if I'm only up there for a few minutes, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna do something real. I'm gonna say hi, but I'm gonna, you know, I'll, I'll do some real material. So take me back. You, you started doing stand up 
quite some time ago. I know you've been in the industry for 25 years now. Mm -hmm. um, when you first started, you needed to side hustle and you were digging ditches. Who are you digging? I know that's for? random. Bro, and that's, I, but, I have some to context ask. to that. <laughs> you were side hustling for the like, cartel, like, oh. bro. What's going on? What are you doing? <laughs> we all have a past. Um, <laughs> no, at the time I was uh, working for a cell phone company called LA Cellular, uh, lo like real close by to here. Um, and I had quit my job to pursue comedy, and I found out right away that I wasn't doing enough to sustain myself. And so I needed to do stuff to just make money to pay the real quick, quick money, but I didn't want to commit to something because I had been offered a, a chance to be a foreman because uh, I was working selling cell phones inside of a, a Home Depot type store. And so I met this man who had his own business and he goes, hey, you're really good with people. You're bilingual. Uh, I would love to hire you and send you to school to be to run my business. He goes, I could offer you. And he he put it out there and I, he was going to pay me very well. Yeah. Um, but it was one of those things where I told him, I go, I, I, I really want to be a comedian. And, and if I do that, I can't, she's like, let me out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I want to be a comedian. And he's, he didn't get it. Uh, but it was one of those <laughs> things. It was one of those things where when I quit the job and I needed money, I called him and he goes, Oh, so you want to be a foreman after all? I go, no, I need it. I need some, something where I could just make some quick cash. Yeah. He goes, the only thing I have, yes, the only thing I have is, uh, you know, digging, digging holes and trenches and stuff like that with the guys. He goes, but that's, that's beneath you, man. You can't be doing that. I go, I need money. And so give me a shovel. And next thing I know, I'm out there freaking, Let's you know? go. And then the guys out there giving me shit. They're like, you know, they're telling me in Spanish, oh yeah, tú, tú que hablas inglés. You're know, like, yeah, I speak English. They're like, <laughs> Why are you here? They, they could not. They could not understand why I spoke English and why I was legal, and wanted to dig ditches. And they're like, "What?" They, they're just scratching their heads. And they're like, "They're like, pues ordenanos una pizza. Order us a pizza since you speak English." I'm like, "All right, I'll order pizza," you know. But uh, I had to do that because I did not want to commit to a job. I had already quit my day job to pursue comedy, and I just needed cash. And so digging How old ditches. Are you? At the time, I was, God, what, twenty? Yeah. What does it look like back in that day when you're trying to do comedy? Because nowadays it's, I feel like comics are, they don't know how easy they have it. I, I, I will be one for an example. Like, bro, I could post a video and get thousands of people to see what I'm doing or where I'm going to be. It's kind of cheating a little bit compared to like how people used to like really run their hours. So how yeah. are you at a 20 year old? Like, how, do you, how did you want to run and go? As a, as a 20 year old, I didn't have uh, the tools that, that comics have today. So uh, there was no social media. You didn't have a phone where you could just, you know, record yourself and post a video. If you wanted to record yourself, you had to have a, a camcorder. A video recorder, like you know, yeah. some, like the one your mom and dad and you, comes out you with. You had to, you had to know somebody like that. Like, that was the big thing back then. Oh, I, I got a friend that that shoots weddings. Oh, really? He shoots. If you could find a wedding dude, that was the, that was the ultimate. He's the guy. Jackpot. That's your guy right there. <laughs> yeah, that's that's so your true. guy. So you you needed to find a wedding guy that shoots videos and and that had the 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 the, the machine that that could put text on the screen. You don't realize how, like, and just you thought to, just that to, shit was crazy. When you could get your name, oh, man, really, they'll put your name on the text on the screen and not captions, yeah. but just your name. Like, yeah. And then for bookings, <laughs> that's that. me. For bookings. And then, you know, so back then, it's like, God, you, you, you really, you, first of all, you had to talk to people. You had to be good at making calls. That's nice. funny. Nice. Uh, I did that with my mind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Were you, did you hand out flyers? Uh, yes. You had to, uh, no, oh. You had to make friends with an artist, somebody who could make flyers. Because back in the day, uh, when I was 20, the big thing was uh, raves, nightclubs, mm. going, you know, uh, everybody was throwing parties. Were and you so at raves? I was not. That was not my thing. <laughs> okay. I, I would love to see you at a rave. And no, no. I, I went to one. It was a one and done. I'm like, this is not for me. I hate this. I'm going on. It became a wave. <laughs> like, okay, I'll yeah. see you guys later. I'm the out. The rave was a wave. <laughs> But uh, yeah, back then we didn't have any of the, the tools of now, so it was very challenging. You had to, again, make phone calls, remember people's names. You had to write names down, you know, follow up, make a phone call. You didn't text. Well, that wasn't an option. Yeah. You had to make a phone call. And then you'd have to uh, have people vouch for you. That was the credit back then. If you can get somebody to call on your behalf, hey, listen. I got this friend of mine. He's really funny. He's kind of shy. He's going to go out there and, and just, give him, just give him five minutes. You'll see. 
Having somebody call for you was huge back then, and that's how you would get your foot in the door in places. You needed to know somebody that knew somebody. And nowadays, it's that's you know you don't that's you just get your phone. It's like whatever. Do you miss that type of day? It's different. Um, I do miss the the connections you would have with people because it was more so face to face. It was a real verbal. relationship. It was a real relationship. Yeah. You know, and I think that things come so easy to us on our phones that a lot of times it's like, eh, okay, I'll get back to them whenever. Or, yeah. you know, you, you leave somebody on red and you don't realize like some people are take like, oh my God, he left me on. Like, it's just back then I feel like it was a lot, you were connected better back yeah. then. Social media made it less social. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I wish I could go back in those days because like now you go to a parties or events and everybody's just on their phone. Nobody even cares Nobody, about talking to them. No, yeah. And to me, I grew up with a Middle Eastern dad that's like, how he learned English it was at Home Depot talking to everybody. Like, he would talk to every single Wait, person. Wait, hold on. So you're not Mexican? I'm not. Uh, I, knew, I <laughs> knew that. I just wanted <laughs> to say it. I grew up in it's Arizona. Like, hey, me dijeron que este wey, wey. <laughs> I, I grew up in Arizona, so I was surrounded by Spanish people. Um, and they, the, the way you guys are raised and the way we're raised is very, very much almost the same. Stay out of trouble. Don't talk to your mom and dad with any attitude. Like, we would have that common ground. We would watch our white friends talk to their parents and then just be like, there's no way. There's no way. My mom watched my friend talk to his mom one day, and I, I wasn't allowed to hang out at their house anymore. Because she was like, no, that's a bad example. My neighborhood would always tell their kids, well, what does Mrs. Janko say about that? You go listen to her, and then she would set the rules so everybody would hate me because my mom was paranoid. But that's, I don't know if that's, how was your relationship with your mom? Oh, I had the best relationship with my mom. My mom was just everything. So there was not a, a whole lot of arguing and, and back and forth. Uh, I loved her very much. But, you know, there are those times, especially when you're going through the hormonal changes, the 10, 11, 12, and then, you, you know, you 16, 17, 18, where you, uh, you know, it's just you're, you're running on, on different hormones. And so there was a couple of times where I got a little louder than I should have. Yeah, but, but she I, probably but showed I, you. But then I felt today, yeah? I felt bad immediately. So, you know, like I never, I can honestly say I never got disciplined as a kid uh, physically. So there was, I never got hit with a belt, hit with a shoe. You know, everybody has those stories. Oh man, I pissed on my mom, and you know, back in the day, because back in the day it was like it was on. It, yeah. was, the, <laughs> it was the Wild West, you know. <laughs> but um, my mom, whenever she would get quiet, that would scare me because I'd hear stories from my brother and my sisters. And my brother <laughs> and sisters- I hear stories. My, my, <laughs> yeah, my brother and sisters, they, uh, they made it very clear that like, hey, don't cross mom. And they're like, you have a different mom than we did. Are you the she, baby? Yes. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, she listens to you. You know, she caters to you. She didn't cater to us. And it's just like, well, sorry. You know, I'm like, <laughs> thanks for taking over for the team so I could live this life, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, we were, we're, you know, we had a great, great uh, connection. Um, you know, again, she was my hero. It was just my mom and I. So my siblings were all grown up and out of the house by the time I showed up. There's a huge gap. Oh, what, what age like difference? 14. Four, there's 14 wow. years. So I remember living with my sister for a little bit, and then she was gone doing her own thing. And so it was just my mom and I, so I was like almost being an only child. So I got all the attention. It was great. Yeah. And uh, I didn't fight with her a whole lot, but mm -hmm. I knew better. Yeah. And then my mom would always point out people in the neighborhood that were doing things that weren't good. Mm. Yeah. Don't be like that. Don't be like that. Don't be like that. Don't be like that. What made you listen? I don't know. I guess maybe there was a little bit of fear, you know, because my mom, I'd see how my mom would talk to other people, <laughs> but she wouldn't do that to me if, if things weren't going right. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. So you saw that side of her a little bit, and you're like, I don't yeah. want to get there. We're good. We're friends. We have something good going on. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. it was a rough neighborhood that we lived in, and we lived right on the corner. And so she would tell me when I go outside, you stay where I can see you, okay? You stay where I can see you. And so she would sit in the window, and you know, she would like crochet or whatever the hell she was doing up there. And I'd go out and play in the street and stuff like that. And if she saw me talking to somebody that looked sketch, hey, get inside. Pa dentro. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, all right. You know, and my mom always spoke loud, so yeah. I, never I never felt like yelling because, you know, because was, she was just loud. But yeah. when, when I saw her get upset with somebody, that's when it's like, mmm, all right, let's not get her there. <laughs> was she a fan of you doing comedy? Yeah. She was, how can I put it? When I told her what I wanted to do, she, her whole thing was, I want you to be happy. That's all she would say. I want you to be happy. I don't get it but I want you to be happy. Uh, when 
I did comedy in the beginning, she thought it was cool because it was like a hobby. Oh, he's doing something he enjoys. That's nice. That's how he spends his free time. He's doing something that's, um, that's positive, not like, you know, I didn't have a crazy bad habit. You know what I mean? But I still had my job. Right. Now, when I quit my job, oh, I heard it. I heard it. Are you literally <laughs> snoring? Dude, I heard I this. Like, and I, I, snoring? I thought it was Bell. I was like, Bell, why are you breathing? And I, try, I kept trying to go like this, like, bro, get your nose out of the mic, bro. I can hear you breathing. But that's so funny that it's your dog. That's really snoring. Did you snoring. practice a lot of your jokes on your mom when you were growing up? Like, was she your audience? No, absolutely really? not. <laughs> absolutely not. It's a that, tough crowd. That woman was the toughest crowd. And again, she didn't want me to pursue this as a career. She thought it was okay for a hobby. But her whole thing was, you have a, a real job that pays you very well. Because when I worked for a cell phone company, I, I, was, I was paid very, I made, you know, I was working on commission in sales, selling cell phones back in the day. It was, I mean, I was killing it. 1997 uh, selling phone. I was probably doing about 5K a month. What? 5K a month. That's oh. a lot right now. Hey, dog, I'll be and mad as at a, you too. And as a, <laughs> as a, as a uh, um, you know, you got to figure. I was 20 years old. Uh, my rent was half my rent because I shared an apartment with a with a friend. My rent was like 350, 400 bucks a month. Wow. And then I had a car note and, and insurance, and so everything else. I was, eating, I was just eating out every night. Yeah. Let's where, where are we gonna go eat? You yeah, know. That's Because I, cause I worked goes. on commission. I'm like, and I was really good at selling. I was just, you know. Was, You're lucky there was no Postmates back in the day, bro. Oh, they would have destroyed you. But that yeah. was the best part about first starting to get a paycheck when you are young, when you are a teenager, was to be able to go to the restaurants. Because personally, like, my mom, she never let us eat out, like, ever. So when I started getting my own paycheck, I was like, oh, I'm getting myself some good snacks outside, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's what you did. That's right. It's the same thing. I, rem uh, I remember I went out to, uh, I would go to Lakewood Mall, and uh, they'd have, the, uh, I remember telling myself, oh, it's cool to eat at the mall, at the food court. I said, but one day I'm going to be able to eat at the restaurants that are outside of the mall in on that same area. Because like they had a, a Mimi's Cafe, they had a Black Angus. I was like, I always wanted to eat at Black Angus. When you was know? the first time you ever did? Oh, God. Uh, well, when I, when I was selling cell phones. When I was selling cell phones, man, I, was, I felt like I was balling. I remember I went hey to man, Wilson's. Hey, man, you were. <laughs> you were. Yeah. I, I went to Wilson's House of Suede, and I bought myself a leather jacket, like a trench coat. Leather. And you could just smell it. Everywhere I'd walk it, you'd smell <laughs> it. And it had, like, the lining. It was bad. I still have it. It's, it's a real nice jacket. Um, but, yeah, I was, I was doing that. So when I quit that job, my mom, my mom flipped out because she's like, you have a great job that pays you very well. You have insurance. You, no one's ever had, like, we had grew up, I think, on Cigna or whatever the insurance was uh, that they, you know, that they will provide for you. Yeah. Um, my mom made it a big deal about the insurance. She goes, you have no idea how lucky you are. And it's not regular insurance. It was PPO, like the best. Yeah, dental. I had just gotten myself braces. Uh, and so my mom was very upset with me, and she thought that I was, I was making a huge mistake by quitting my job to pursue comedy. So she did not think I was funny <laughs> and she did not think I was making a good choice in, in, in Does going. that hurt? Does that hurt that your, that your family doesn't believe in you? Does that like, or does that make you want to prove it more? It didn't hurt. I just felt like she didn't really understand. Um, or maybe she did because my father was a mariachi. My father was an entertainer. My father was a touring act. My mm -hmm. father, that's how she met my, she met my dad at a nightclub. Let's go. You know, and so maybe she understood too much and just didn't tell me. Maybe she just didn't want me to go down that road because, you know, her and my dad were no longer, you know, together. They were no longer a thing. And I don't know. But she, but she didn't she never laughed at my comedy on stage, but I could make her laugh in, you know, in the room. Yeah, she she maybe didn't necessarily want you to just not make people laugh she probably was just worried because she knows that the industry is tough that's what i mean yeah so knowing that the industry is tough let's get into that because you've been in this game for 25 years at the highest level possible legit dodger stadium you're the first and only comedian to ever do that beatles had a hard time doing that that's ridiculous to say that it sounds like i'm making up what you've got going on in your life how do you go from you know working very hard, having a, like, a roommate splitting 350 for rent to the success that you are now, how do you keep your heart the same? How do you keep humble? How do you keep grounded? How do you 
put up your boundaries because when I met you, immediately I told Bell, I go, he's down to earth and he still has his heart. And that to me is the best compliment I could ever give a man because I've met very, very good men, great men fall to this type of stuff. Not because they wanted to, it's because their environment broke them so many times they become bitter or angry or prideful. It's a very slippery slope. How did you manage to keep yourself where you're at? I think uh, uh, luck had a lot to do with it and having the the upbringing, you know, it's like uh, the way that I was raised by my mom. And it's just, it was, again, we go back to that conversation before we, we got started about, you know, religion and what you believe in and just the way you, you should be. Just treat people well. Be nice to people. It's harder to be a dick. You got to go out of your way to be an asshole. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's so much easier to just be nice, you know. I am a reactive person, so I'll give a person a, a chance and then freaking, you know, her if, if, if need be. But I, I, told, I, I told Bella I'm a bully to bullies. If you're, if you're going to come at me, I'll bite you back. I just don't like to start it. I love finishing it, though. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, guys? My name is George Janko, and I wanted to kind of walk you guys through how I start my morning. I do start my day with a biohacker set, but today I actually want to just focus on two things that are very, very important. A lot of people have been really hyping about. Lion's Mane. This gives you mental clarity. I love to start my day with two little droppers of this in my orange juice. Super easy. And then cordyceps. Cordyceps, a lot of people just take cordyceps by itself just for a pre-workout. I like to include the lion's mane just because I want that extra focus. So after I'm done with the gym and I'm in the steam room, I got my workout in, but I also could sit there and meditate, focus on things that I need to get done. And it tastes amazing, honestly. You should taste it for yourself just to get yourself your own opinion, but hold on. And then done, I'm ready for the day. If you don't want to do tinctures, you can do gummies. I do recommend the biohacker set, but I get it, it's a lot, maybe overwhelming. So if you want to start with cordyceps and lion's mane, you are more than welcome to, my friend. Start your day a little bit focused and energized. Link is in the description, get it today. I'll see you guys later. Um, but as far as uh, maintaining, um, I, I guess I, I, in my mind, it's like I still haven't gotten there yet. And I, I keep telling myself that, so it's like, you know, and also to the <laughs> people, the people, you got to keep, you know, because once you, once you tell yourself that you have achieved it, you stop working for it. You stop, you stop pushing. You stop trying to grow because you're like, well, I'm here. I made yeah. it. I crossed the finish line. So you, you got to always con continuously keep, you know, keep saying to yourself, all right, we, we got to, we, we got to keep growing. We got to keep going, moving. Mm -hmm. And if you're still moving, you want to make sure that you're, um, you know, you, you don't burn bridges. It, burning bridges is, is, a, is a terrible thing to do. And I think a lot of people just get to a certain place and they forget the road mm. that took to get there. Yeah, yeah I that? know, right? We, hey, you guys wanted to do the interview here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought it's an industrial area. So you're going to hear phones. You're going to hear dogs snoring. Those are the, uh, I guess, the company next door. They clean, um, they clean like forklifts and, and con, you know, con, contractors type equipment, big equipment. Yeah. So right now they're probably cleaning a forklift or just right on the door. The power hose. Yeah. Right, yeah. We know you're doing an interview, buddy. <laughs> and what's crazy is like it's a thick wall and then there's a second wall out in the parking lot. So I can only imagine how loud that is to the guy that's actually cleaning. Yeah, they must need a lot of power for those big, you know, those big forklift yeah. machines. <laughs> But speaking of... Oh, but, oh uh, but to answer the question, though, I, uh, in my mind, I'll, all this can go away tomorrow. Hmm. And if all this goes away tomorrow, then what do you have? You know? And I feel like I would have the relationships that I made with people. You know? I'd still be able to talk to everybody, even though I don't have anything. I was nice to people. I was cool with people. And so whether this is here or it's not here, I can still go back to, to whoever I was, yeah. you know, uh, before this. You, and it, it just, it's one of those things where I, I never want to forget. And I'm always talking to people and I'm always, uh, like, for example, maintaining the relationships from before comedy. You know, there's still a couple people out there that knew me from way back when. And I think those are the people that really kept me grounded. And I'm like, okay, I still have that connection to the past right there. That's amazing because those are the important things in life and so many people I feel like have to, you know, kind of not not realize that and they have to fall and you know they have to learn the hard way and you know prioritize the wrong things and then be alone and then realize like oh wow, I should have really taken the time to realize what was important in front of me, you know? So I think you got that from his mom because your mom was making you observe other people's behaviors. Mm -hmm. So at a young age you realize, okay, this guy fell because of his ego, so you probably were like, okay, I'm not going to I'm going to stay away from that because you, you were your first at, in your in your line of life. Like you're the one that, out of your family that made it in the industry at the level that you have. So there's a lot of new things that nobody could kind of guide you in. 
So yeah, there was definitely no manual or, or instructions on to you know doing any of this. Like seriously, it was one of those things where like wow, like okay, people say, well, what, what was the plan? I'm like, there was no plan. <laughs> you know, there was literally no plan for any of this, and uh, I was just lucky that I I was able to. Um, not only be a, a, a comic, but I was able to not get too stupid. And that's funny, I say not get too stupid as we're sitting in a building full of cars. <laughs> <laughs> early on. Of cars. <laughs> early on. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to do a tour my, of this place. I never got out of control. <laughs> I never let it get to a place where... This is very tamed. Know, it was... It was <laughs> so the wide he, shot while he's saying yeah, it. Yeah, because, you know... So yeah, maintaining my humbleness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How did your mom feel once you started like getting all that success and you know what, things started to change in your life? My my mom knew that what I was doing after you know once I showed her, then she un, she got it like oh he's good at this. Yeah. She still wouldn't laugh at the jokes though. <laughs> Dude, she's a hater. One of, one of the one of the jokes early on that I had about my mom was how she doesn't get it. And like, I post, I don't get it. That was her thing. I even had bumper stickers that I would sell at the shows that that would say I don't get it. And that was that was a, a, a thing. And I'd sell them for like two bucks. And I'm like, hey, if you guys buy the bump the bumper sticker, I'm gonna go take my mom to eat with that money. <laughs> and I'd sell all my stickers. Like, hey, mom, look at this. Pay, me selling this bumper sticker. That's why we're at Sizzler. <laughs> And then I remember we were at Sizzler like three days in a row, and my mom was just like, I couldn't get used to this. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you could get used to this, mom. <laughs> She's like, I still won't laugh, though. <laughs> well. well, Okay, so a comedian, he starts his career, and it takes him a bit to, like, find his voice. <clears throat> when did you find your voice? I think once I started... Uh, cause in the beginning it was just characters, voices, impressions. That's all I did. It was, you didn't know anything about me. You just knew that I could go up there and I could just do impressions and sound effects. And I was very animated. And so it's like, you know, it's funny, but you didn't really know anything about me. And so I remember I, I did one joke where I talked about, uh, dancing at a club. And I says, I, I, I only dance with big girls, uh, so that we finish at the same time. <laughs> because, and then I did a bit, you know, <laughs> and, and I remember I got a laugh on. I'm like, wow, that's the first time I've actually said something about me. And then I, I did a story about my mom. And that was like the first time where I broke that wall of just being characters and sound effects and actually having some substance there. And what I learned to do was just tell stories, but still incorporate all the things that made me uh, uh, like made it entertaining. So instead of just telling a story about, oh, yeah, so there I was, and then I ran into this girl, and she was really fun uh, and nice, then I would change that, and then I'd be like, yeah, so I ran into this girl, and she's like, oh, my God, seriously? So automatically, you're telling a story, but now you're painting a picture. So I was doing all the voices and impressions and everything, and then still talking about real things. That's, an, that's amazing, because I thought this whole time Robin Williams may have like, kind of inspired you to do impersonations, because I know he was somebody that... Robin he... Williams definitely was one of the inspirations. Uh, I remember watching uh, Live at the Met when I was a kid, uh, Robin Williams. I and, haven't watched it. Yeah, it was, it's a good one. And, and one thing about him is that I loved how he could entertain you, and he could also get you emotional. You know, there's some comics that'll make you think, and mm -hmm. that's, okay, so, okay, like, for example, Carlin was really good at making you think. Robin Williams could actually make you feel something other than the, the, the humor, mm -hmm. and he would tell these stories about his son, and I'm like, wow, you could feel those moments, and, and, and you know, and obviously you could see when, when you know, when he would do movies, and he'd do drama, he was really, really good at that, and I liked that he could make himself vulnerable, and... That was one of those things too, where it's like, all right, let me let me put some put some real stuff out there and see how this goes, and it, it just it felt good. It felt good to open up about certain things on stage, and people could relate to that. A lot of comics use um, comedy for like a way to express themselves through pain and stuff. Do do you see yourself as one of those Absolutely. comics? Absolutely. Really? Absolutely. Now, have you found a better way to express yourself though besides comedy? I've tried therapy. I've actually uh, gone to sit there and. Pay my freaking 250 for the hour. How do you feel about that? In the beginning, I'm just like, oh god, I thought it was the biggest waste of time. My ex wanted wanted us to go to uh, do some couples therapy, you know, just like, hey, let's let's try to hash things, you know, fix the, fix our situation. And I, I thought that therapy was uh, was showing weakness, and I didn't like that. 
I didn't like that I would be, you know, it's one thing to be vulnerable with one another person. It's another thing when you bring in a stranger and now you're, you're exposing your thing right here. And it just, it felt like, ugh, I didn't like it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I it's pushed, a different pushed, level of vulnerability. Yes, it is. And you're paying them? Shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so once we started doing couples therapy, it was like, all right, okay, I'm, I see it, I get it. And then we broke up and I continued to see the therapist by myself. Mm. And after a while, it became a thing where I'm like, okay, uh, it, it, you know, I'd walk out of there and more than anything, it showed me how to ask myself questions because I felt Reflection. like, you know, so I, I thought it was a very good thing. Um, I still prefer the stage. It's a lot more fun, but having somebody, you know, say, well, how, how does that make you feel? Do, have you stopped to think about, and that was her, her thing. Have you stopped to think about how, and I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, I have more issues than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't that always happen though? You know? Do you feel like it gave you new tools to be able to handle conflict or situations in your life or? I feel like it showed me how to listen better because I, I feel like I was always, you know, because I was doing what I was doing, like, how could I be wrong? How could I be wrong? Look, look at what, you know, look at what we're, where we're at, what's going on, what's, what, every, if I'm wrong, really, I'm wrong? So I didn't, I didn't see it, I was like, no. No, I'm not wrong. Because if this is wrong, I don't want to be right. Thank you. That's, yeah. that's one of those things. But, you know, it, it was possible to still uh, be the wrong way or say the wrong thing. You know, I had to really just take a step back and allow myself to go, all right, maybe I'm not always right. And that's a hard thing to do. Totally. Um, I, I had to check myself. And I felt like that's why I, you know, I do appreciate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> another reason why I have like dogs they're they're beautiful because they love you unconditionally they don't care if you stink they don't care you know what you say or do at the end of the day as long as you make them feel safe and comfortable they love you yeah. and I you can learn a lot from that sometimes mm -hmm. silence is 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 okay yeah you know? they give you like security and peace yes mm -hmm. silence being okay was that a problem for you back in the day it was because I always felt like there needed to be something there Yes. You know who, who taught me that I don't need to do that? Uh, Matthew Perry was in an interview and he said, I realized one day that I don't always have to make people laugh. And I felt like if I wasn't doing that, if I was quiet, I feel like I'm rude. And I'm like being disrespectful or the uncomfortable nature is like God gave me the ability to not make this uncomfortable. So I'll do that. I remember I was in the elevator with him once and I was upset and I sat there quiet and there was people in the elevator and we went up, not one person said anything. It was the first time I've ever rode an elevator where I didn't talk to anybody. Like, I couldn't believe that other people were okay just sitting there not talking. And it was so weird to me that how could you stand next to a stranger and not get to know him? And when he told me that, and I'm like, people don't normally talk in elevators. I'm like, you always talk in an elevator? He's like, yeah. I'm like, okay. I just felt like, I, I don't know. I just like getting to know people. It's just, a, it's a, I don't know. I just always be, I've always been like that. How, how, do, you, uh, how do you manage to... Because, like, it, it might be hard for the audience to understand this because when you're in show business, right, they only see what you want them to see. The, they don't see the joke when you're building it. They see the joke when it's ready to go. But with those jokes come the actual real pain that you go through. The industry is so tough, man. You could lose friends. You could lose uh, people that you broke bread with. There's people that you look at in the eyes and be like, you're my brother for life. And now he's gone. And you have no idea how that even got there because you realize you're in an industry that you have to delegate with other people's egos, prides, their, their relationship, the way they deal with things in their home. It's not yours. It's mm -hmm. like there, there's so many things that could break your heart. What, what was And now like, all that happens every day. How do you deal with it? cry uh <laughs> drink <laughs> really really because like that I, you know it's, i'm not joking i uh, smoked for a uh, bit to numb myself over it you, you you find ways to to deal but and that I'm, can't be healthy it can't and it's not it's not uh you know did you catch yourself drinking a lot because of that yes still are you are you still uh, drinking actively why well, I, I drink all the time really yeah but i mean you know you to be social but i mean it's not like a uh how can i say it you don't do it to cope so much anymore? No, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't. But I still, deal with the situ I still deal with the situation of people coming into my life and people coming, you know, going, leaving my life. And that's, 
that still happens. And it's, again, you know, a lot of uh, relationships are affected because we do this, because it's a, you know, it's this, show business is, is crazy. It really is. It, and, and if you're not careful, it, you know, people do get hurt. I, I feel like you didn't know, and this could just be from my observation, because this is what happened to me. I didn't know how deep that rabbit hole goes. And I think this is the reason why good people fall. Because I've seen really, really good, like, enthusiastic, loving people just get burned so many times that they're like, okay, this is how I have to act and, be, and, and behave for me to get respect from people. So how do you become the light of the room and still respectful, but also put up your boundaries saying, like, I'm not going to leave you, but if you cross this line, you're leaving me. It's, it's really hard because I feel like I've, I've been really bad at setting boundaries. I've been really, really bad at setting boundaries because, you know, it's, it's hard to say no. It is hard to say no, especially to people that you love and care about. Um, when they see how things are going, there is a sense of entitlement amongst the people that are around you. And it's hard to tell them, hey, this is, this, this is I mean, I'm sharing some of this with you, but it's, it's not, you know, all available to you and that's how do they forget this and and it's 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 really hard to establish that because then once you start showing them that you're trying to build a boundary all of a sudden you're the problem you're the asshole you're the you know and then you're like no that's not what i'm trying to say i it's just that and and then you question yourself you're like am i the asshole should this be for everybody what am i you know yeah sure you could borrow 30k yeah no yeah no pay back whenever okay yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to be the bad guy. You don't want to be the bad guy because you know you want to do good. I understand everything you're saying right now. And, and so what what was the first like boundary that you're like, okay, I know you're having difficulties setting boundaries, but I'll give you an example, right? We'll use your family as one of them because that's how you could kind of branch out. Practice at home and then you use it everywhere else. There was an interviewer saying that you were driving your car and you said, if if you never really struggled or worked for something, how could you really appreciate Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Okay. And then you have a joke where you talk about your son being spoiled. Now you love your son. You don't want him to go through the obstacles that you went through, but you also don't want him to be a spoiled brat. How did you set boundaries there? That was a really difficult one because uh, I remember telling my, my girl when we first got together, you know, because I saw how hard she worked and, and the struggle was real. And I said, I don't want you guys to have to struggle. And she understood, she got it, she, cause she went through it. However, my son didn't, he didn't, he was too young to really understand and see it and making someone go through, like how do you make your, your kid struggle? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like how do you- uh, You can only then, tell them I, so many yeah, stories. Yeah, it's like, <clears throat> the stories don't work. Mm -hmm. They have to actually go through it. Cause and, his environment's different. Yeah. When your brothers and sisters we're saying, hey, don't talk to mom when she gets quiet, blah, 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 don't cross that line. You are still in their environment. Mm. But if he's not in your environment, he can't walk your path. Did you feel guilty that time that he walked in and those shoes were just sitting there and he just kind of was like, cool. And you're like, dude, you have no idea what it feels like to get these shoes. Did that scare you that you might have broke his like eyes in life? Uh, I, I, could, I could see it happening, unfortunately, because of how much I was working. It's like, all right. Do I, because I would, I would tell him, do you understand what needed to happen in order for this to be this way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, oh God. <laughs> that's, that, that's why I feel like no matter what, I, I feel like this generation just won't, uh, will have everything at their disposal, but they won't have struggle. Struggle is something that is going to take, you don't just get, you can't just download it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's something you have to experience and go through. You got to know what it's like to fall on your face, to hear no, to, to claw your way to get to a goal, to want something bad enough, like a, a badass pair of shoes. Okay. Like for him at that time, it was like, okay, cool, whatever. Like, dude, do you understand? Like, I, uh, you know, for me to dig ditches, how many ditches I would have to dig in order to pay for that pair of, you know, when you work the math like that, like I understand it, but how do you make someone else understand it without putting them through it? And yep. you can't, yep. you can't, they will not understand it until they have to actually do it. Like, you know, that's that old saying, tough love. Sometimes you got to just let them 
let them figure it out on their own. But then that feels bad because I'm like, I always feel like I could help. I could make, I could fix this. Like that. Like that. Mm -hmm. But then by fixing it, I just enable this person to rely on me the next time things get bad. Yeah. And they're never going to have that sense of, of, of urgency to do anything because they're, they're always going to know that I'm going to be that safety net. So it's, it sucks. And I don't want to see my friends struggle and fall and fail and go through things. But at the same time, I don't want them to freaking just think that they could come to me at any moment and have me bail them out. Yeah. And so it's it's hard. It really is. And um, having people try to get people on, on board or, or f understand where I'm coming from, because they just they, it, you sound like an asshole when you try to say this is how I feel. But they're like, dude, you wouldn't even notice it is really it's going to affect you like is it really. You but it's can't. not your job yeah. to tell me how I'm going to how I'm going to deal with it. I, I don't know how you dealt with it, but I had it before I, I met this. You, a lot of cry, a lot of crying. A lot of crying. <laughs> like, what the fuck are they? Yeah, what but am I supposed to do? Did you get angry before the cry? Because I would explode. Like I would hold it in, and then when you did break that line, and sadly for my part, it was always on something that people were like, "Why did you get mad at that?" It was always the last straw. Was at a random thing, and when I explode, I just like I'm 100% in. So like I'm either 100% going to be your servant, or I'm going to 100% be your enemy. Like I can't be 50-50, it's just weird. I feel like I'm faking it here, and then if I fake it here, I just feel like you're making me a fake person, I can't do this. So it's like, yo, these are the boundaries, like don't cross them, like don't, but it's, it, I've been in the game only for 10 years, and it's still the hardest thing to do is say no to somebody, like hey, no. Like, I'm sorry, I don't think it's appropriate, you didn't work for it yet, and then you look like the bad guy, but nobody just gave it to me to do that. You, you have to work for it. Yeah, you, and you never look good saying no. no. And the person that you're saying no to doesn't all of a sudden go, you know what? I respect your answer, and, and, and thank you for, for you know, enlightening me. Yeah. You know, you're greedy, bro. You have all this, Auto and you don't Automatically, want it's that. Automatically, it's like, oh, that's how it is? Oh, Okay. Oh, but well, then, oh. do you feel like then, in a way, you kind of are able to see that person's true colors? Like, unfortunately, it's, it sucks because you guys have to swallow the hard pill of being like, you know, I have to swallow the, the pain of you probably being mad with me, but I know I'm doing what's better for you. You just don't know it yet, but I'm doing what's better for you. And then, hopefully, if you have somebody who responds to you, you know, properly or in a humble way, then you're like, okay, this person, like, this person's right. The, the problem, though, is that I, I will see the, the like, like, ah, shoot, this is how they're reacting, their, their colors, but it's too late. I'm already invested in the person. I already care about this person. Mm -hmm. I love this person. This person, they've known me. Th all, and, and a lot of times, too, what will happen is I'll hear uh, people, will t remind, and, and it sucks because I, I always, I, I fall for it, where they'll tell me, you know, I was there before all of this, you know. I've known you for how long now? So... They, they, they remind you about how it, the, the amount of time spent, and then you're like, you're right, okay, you know, and... and, and this then grows you, and trust issues, like, man. Ugh. There's no way it doesn't. Like, does this impact you oh, for making new friends? It's really hard. It, it really is, because I can, I can meet people all day, but then it's like, all right, uh, day one is always fun. It's, it's the honeymoon. It's great. We're cool. It's all laughing, fun. Second time, same thing. But then once you start hanging out after a while, then you start figuring out, okay, is there an angle to this? You know, is there an actual friendship being built here? Or is it a, um, uh, is, this, is this just going to be an acquaintance? Somebody that, you know, hey, well, we do things for them. They do things for me. Kind of a, you know, like, does or, it, or is, it, is it something where it can actually be a, a friendship? Does this affect you when it comes to dating? Oh, absolutely. Um, How do you get past this? Do you date people that are elevated? Or do you just date? man? I still make horrible choices. I have bad decisions. It's yeah. I'm 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 not good at. And somebody reminded me of that the other day. They're like, you need to start hanging out and talking to people that are 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 closer to where you're at in life. Have to be, you know. And and, and I go, but it's hard to meet those people. It's like you know how how do you do it? It's it, you the know, road I, here I is wanna, hard. So I don't want to be on a on a dating app or, or, or have a friend set me up. It's just, it. Do you DM on Instagram? Yeah. 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 The way you said That's it didn't sound too exciting, man. Yeah. You, are you like a, a video guy or like a message type of guy? Um, more message. You know, I, I like texting and stuff like that, but. I, and used, also to, too, I used to send videos. Also too, I don't, I don't, I don't chase like, uh, I'm, 
it just it's there. You know Let's what go. I mean? It's okay, like, fluffy. Like, like all right. <laughs> You know, so I, I've never been good at, at pursuing. I'm always like the, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, you got me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> but you have the one. I'll, I'll stop running. <laughs> you have the one thing that every girl wants, and that's to make them laugh. Literally. Like, I told guys all the time when I, when I was single and I was dating a bunch of girls, they would ask me, how, would you, how do you get girls? I go, dude, money, height, all this stuff is, is great. Success is great, but if you make somebody laugh and you feel like you're just a party and when they see you, they're just, they're happy, they, they know that they're going to have an enjoyable time, it's hard to beat that. You can't beat that. And so you're carrying around the torch of like, you hang out with me, unless you're hanging out with somebody that's like your mom and then she's just not going to laugh at you. No, right? Which you're going to marry somebody like your mom that's going to be fun. She's not oh, going to no. laugh at a single thing you say <laughs> and you're going to be like, this is the one. <laughs> Well, I know she's here well, for the right reason. Every relationship that went south was because they became my mom. <laughs> you know what I mean? No way. <laughs> was that your doing? Did you make them your mom? I, I don't know. I'm going to have to question myself about that one. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's ponder that one. Reflect. Did Back you ever therapy. think? Did that, you ever think? Yeah, that's so funny. You How's know, your so, relationship with your son now? Because I know he's 26. He's you know, getting he, married yeah. soon? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. No, it's actually, uh, it's, it's so much better because... You know, he's he's not a kid anymore. He's doing adult things. You know, we have a lot more in common. Um, I love the fact that he'll just message me randomly, whereas before it was always me reaching out to him and yeah. like, oh, my God, am I bugging? Am I annoying? You know? Yeah. So I love the fact, hey, Dad, you want a coffee? Like, random. Like, yeah. Oh. And so he'll just come by. He lives, you know, right up the street from here, so it's, you know, we're really close. Oh, that's awesome. And then I, I still talk to his mom regularly which I think is great too. We yeah. have a nice, you know, a good friendship and we're always talking about him and we're always still trying to, you know, like parent him even though it's like, okay, he's an adult, but you know, he's about to get- He'll never stop he, being your son. He, he was seven when you were introduced to him, correct? Yeah. So what, how was that like? And how, so how 20 you, years, man. 20 years, so he's 27 now. He'll, he'll be 27 in uh, December. Mm. Was it frightening or was it like just love at first sight? Like, man, I love this kid. Like. How did that? He react? looked just like me, which was crazy. So this is a modern when I, family when episode. I, when, bro. I first, when I first met him, when I first met him, I'm like, I looked at him. I'm like, oh my god! And then I looked at my girl, and I'm like, clearly you have a type. <laughs> you gotta, yeah. All right, you know, no one's gonna question this. So when I would tell people, yeah, he's my stepson, and they're like, nah. Like, but he looks just like you. And then so uh, uh, I remember I would I would bring him out on stage. I go, you guys, you got to see him, my, my kid. Because I would dress him like me, and I'd bring him on stage. And then I'd give him the same haircut. And so I'd st we'd both stand there. And then i go, turn around. And then he'd turn around. And people were just laughing because he looked just like me. Wow. He was a, you know, chubby cheeks and just big smile. And, you know, you give him the same haircut and put on the same shirt. You're like, yeah, yeah it's your kid. And so, you know, I, and even my mom, she just kind of. Like, are you, you know, sure? Yeah, a, 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 a. <laughs> you know, certain, certain features. But you look at my, my son now, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, he lost all the weight. He's slim. And he likes telling people that, you know, like, oh, you lost all that, all that weight. And goes, I didn't do it the right way. You know, he always, he always likes telling people, I didn't do it the right way. What, wait, why? What does well, yeah, he mean? Well, that saying that he got sick and, and he had a, you know, he's diabetic and stuff. And so he had a, he lost oh. weight because of, you know, the, yeah. Uh, sugar levels and stuff, and so it wasn't like he went to the gym. Yeah, but that is, is the is right he way. Meant. He did the right thing. He was like, he, okay, I gotta he take care he of this. He fixed his health. <laughs> no yeah, man, he went the only way possible. The yeah. only way. Yeah. You were working on your health the last time I saw you. How are you doing with that? I deal every day, and yep. so like for example, uh, for the last two days, I, I just been lagging. Uh, I'm my own worst person, you know. Uh, trying to get my pills together because I, I take certain medication for blood pressure, diabetes, and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I, I got TK walking around here. She always reminds me, you got to take your pills, take your <laughs> pills. And sometimes I'm like, all right. Uh, it's, you know, it's Do you a have thing. a monitor? So like, I wear, I wear a monitor. It's on, it's, it's on the, this dog arm right here. He's sleeping on it. Yeah. And so if I eat something that's a little bit questionable, you know, it's like a little parole officer that just shows up and beep, 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 oh, beep, really? beep, 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 beep. But I already know. Yeah. You, um, you're on the road a lot. I'm on, I'm on the road a lot. That could get tough for eating because it's like it's different time zones. 
uh, when you land, where are you going to go grab food? Unless you have a chef flying around with you. Do you have a chef flying around with you? Or no. no? Uh, I used to have a person that would go on the road with me who would prepare f- meals and stuff like that. But she was a pill. And it not the like, ones you want to no, take. No, no, no. <laughs> and I realized, man, if I'm going to have somebody that's going to be you know, around me preparing meals and stuff, I need to be able to get along with them and, yeah, and not, not feel like they're annoying. Yeah. Also, she's cooking your food. Dude. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's the most you, vulnerable don't, thing. Don't piss them off. Yeah, yeah. Don't piss them off. But uh, a hard thing for me to, the, uh, a thing that was really hard for me to do was to uh, stop making excuses because I, I used to say, oh, man, well, it's hard for me to find food on the road. It's hard for me. It's after the show. It's hard to find food. It's this and this and that. It's all excuses because I could easily, you know, put something in the refrigerator. I could easily bring something with me. I could easily have somebody pick something up during the day. I just don't do it. And so right now I'm at that crossroads where I'm 47 years old and I've been I've been rocking this weight for a minute. Uh, I was 100 pounds heavier, but I'm still I'm still a big dude. And so I'm at that crossroads right now where I could still fix it. I could still, Why don't you? I could still, uh, that's what I'm dealing with right now. I feel like What's that, the dealing part? The making the choice or because you're so busy <clears> on tour? Being busy is, 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 has nothing to do with it. It's me making the, the choice to, to do it. Food is amazing. And being able to eat out every day is a huge luxury and I enjoy it. I, I love getting in the car, driving somewhere, walking in, sitting in a new place, taking in the environment, trying new things. It is, I, I, could, I literally do it every day. And it's the best thing in the world yeah. for me. The experience is, is like a drug. Like, it's oh my the God. best thing in the world. It is the greatest yeah. thing in the world. And so- Rich or poor, sitting down and eating and, and food with your friends. The best. Yes, and it's, it's a social, it became a social thing where it's like, okay, we're talking, we're eating, we're laughing. It's just this- awesome thing and i know that to get to where i need to be i i can't i can't be in that environment and that scares me like i love it so much you know it's like all right meal prep ah, boring sitting on the chair by myself the dogs don't even want to eat that shit (laughs) they're like dude this is not even wagyu what the fuck you know you're eating that it's it's, why don't you go out and just eat clean bring it with you Oh, you can't bring oh, it. Oh God, no! <laughs> have, no. A little, have a little picnic, no? You don't want to eat clean out there, right? <laughs> so I, I have to, I have to get myself to to a good, a good place to make those corrections because I know that it's you have you don't you don't just eat good one day. You have to make it a th- you have lifestyle. to make it a pattern and a lifestyle. Yeah, and I've done it in the past, but then you know one one trip out to you celebrate. Oh, I lost. 75 pounds. Hey, let's go out to eat to celebrate. And, and then, then you're back all on the of a drugs. sudden, now you're, now you're at 65 pounds lost, not 75. And, you know. You get so demotivating. You play, that, you play that game. But like I said, I'm at that road right now where I could still correct it or I could go down that evil, you know, dark road. Um, I, but I want to be around. I do. And so my motivation is I just, you know, it's not to look better. I don't care. You know, I'm, I do what I do, and it doesn't matter what I look like. I could be slim. I could be big. My shows are still going to be the shows. Everything's going to happen, but it's more so to be around, to be uh, healthy enough to enjoy life. Yeah. For example. Not just to live. Not just to live. When, when, uh, when I take the family to Disneyland, right, uh, I want to be able to walk both parks and be okay at the end of the day. Whereas right now, I'm good for about an hour of walking, and then I'm like, yeah, I want to sit down, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, I, because uh, <laughs> I'm able to do it, I bought a scooter. And so the last time we went to Disney, I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. <laughs> Set the scooter up. And I, I <laughs> rode the scooter the entire day, and I'm like, wow, this was so much better with the scooter. Yeah. And I'm like, like, what's the motivation to want to start Walking the entire, like, yeah, you guys are all tired. I got energy for days, me and my, my scooter. <laughs> so I, gotta take the scooter you know, away I've, now. <laughs> I've, I've, I've started creating these, you know, crutches uh, that, that have not really motivated me to wanna, yeah. you know what it's I mean? It's hard when you have power. Okay, here's the thing. Like, oh, he don't fit in the chair. Mm-hmm. Well, order a custom chair. <laughs> you, you are. Like, this chair right here that I'm sitting on came from a hotel uh, in Palm Springs. It was in my room, 
And I loved Nobody. it. And I, I, I asked this, the, the, the people at the casino, I go, this chair is like the most perfect chair in the world. <laughs> where, did, where, did, where did you get it? I want to order it. <coughs> you know? And, you know, being able to do that has, I feel like having resources is, yes, having resources also is, is like kryptonite for me wanting to get better. The, uh, that's what I was just about to say. So you're, you're at the king of the castle, right? It's hard when you have nobody telling you what to do. When your mom was around, she could be your voice of reason. Like, hey, don't do that. Don't be like so-and-so. But when you don't have that anymore and you're realizing that everybody you love is coming to you for advice, financial decisions or maybe money, uh, 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 relationships, when you realize you're the source, when it comes to your problems, you, you're tired of helping everybody else, so you take the easy way out for yourself. And this could be a, a tricky, tricky path. I was recently reading a study that might actually intrigue you because you said you want to just be around and be healthy, right? You're, you're worried about your blood sugar. You're worried about in the future, God forbid, being at a place where you're alive, but you won't be able to enjoy life at its fullest. There's a study that came out that um, obese people have perfect blood records. And I have an example. My sister, my sister is obese and she has, thank God, very, very good blood. And we have diabetes in our family too. The reason why is because she lifts weights and she does a lot of lifting. And so there's a study that's saying that lifting weights actually help with your insides. So have you ever decided, um, try to just, instead of fixing your diet first, right? Because that's, that's tough, right? That comes with a lot of passion. Like you said, you'd rather go out with your friends. You just crushed what nobody could do in their lifetime. You're exhausted. You don't want to sit by yourself eating a meal. You want to take everybody and go celebrate. So why don't you just start with lifting weights for a year? Get I a did. trainer. I did. I, li I, you know, I, I lifted you know, weights. For a year. I did it for, for a while, but lifting weights is only, you know, yeah, you'll, you'll be stronger, but just because you're lifting weights, if you're still eating like an asshole, it's still going to, you know, but you're, you're right that it, at least if you're lifting weights, you, you, you're strong and you can get up and you can move around. You're, you're, you're carrying that big frame around, mm. but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to lose the weight if you're still eating, you know. Uh, I remember um, I hung out with uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin and he said, you can't you can't out train a shitty diet. You can't out train a shitty diet. He told me you can't out train a shitty diet. You can't out train a shitty diet. And I'm like, that makes <laughs> wow, a lot that of sense. Wow, that was actually like him. <laughs> yeah, scary, right? <laughs> he hates it when I do that. In this, in this. <laughs> you mind not doing that? Well, okay, I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> Have you ever done an impression of somebody and then he got like, oh, maybe I shouldn't like it? Him? <laughs> oh, yeah. so that was it? He's got a great sense of humor. He's got a great sense of humor. But yeah, I don't think anybody likes hearing impressions of themselves, but. So I try not to do it around the, the people, you know, that. Oh, really? Yeah. I think that's fine. Like if somebody could do an impression <clears> of me, I'm like, I would want to see it, you know? I just think that's funny and interesting. But I do have been wanting to ask you this because you've been in so many animated films, animated series, you know, because you're able to do all the voices, the characters. Is how soon into your uh, com comedic career did you start acting? And did you start doing voiceover roles? Because I saw that you were a voice on um, Emperor's New School. And that was pretty early on in your career. Wow, that was really, really early on. Um, I couldn't tell you the year, but you probably could. 2006? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I and loved that show. <clears throat> I loved Emperor's New Groove. Very strong. So uh, once I started doing voiceover work, and, and see, the thing with voiceover work is that, yes, it's a, it's a credit. It's a, you know, it's cool to do these projects, but the financially, it's one of those things where... <clears throat> you had to make yourself available. And as a touring comic, my bread and butter is on the road. Mm -hmm. However, if you're lucky enough to land a voice role on something big, then it, it can blow up and you could be a mater in cars. You could be a character that's like, what the hell? Like, yeah. And uh, I remember I turned down a role to go on the road and the, the role would have blown up. The, uh, for me, it, the, the role did blow up for the person that did it. Um, but after that, I, I, I made it a point. I'm never going to say no to voiceover roles. Did that hurt you? Oh, it stung. I, and it happened twice. <sighs> um, so anytime Why someone presents Why couldn't you just report it on the some, road? It, because at do. the time, mm -hmm. it's not like now where you just take your equipment. You could do your own thing. Oh, was that remember, this was, this was back you. then. And so, it, yeah. you know, you couldn't take the studio with you. 
um, and you couldn't just phone it in. Do you get bitter when you see these comics taking it so easy and you're like, dude, come on, dude. You're like, you dig no ditch, dude. <laughs> you dig no ditch. <laughs> you, you won't know about that ditch. <laughs> um, so the, the, I went out for this role and uh, they needed me to sing in the role. And so I remember I did the, the voice and then I sang the song that they wanted me to sing. And they're like, you got it, it's yours. I'm like, great. Wow. Um, what song was it? Uh, my Way in Spanish. Uh, a, mi man, a Mi Manera, uh, Gypsy King's version. Um, I love Gypsy King. Oh, yeah, great, the, the thing great, great. was is that the movie didn't have uh, a real budget yet. And so they were telling me, hey, look, um, it, you're going to make like, I forget what the amount was. It was uh, like a couple hundred bucks to, to come in and do the recordings and stuff like that. But it's going to require you to, you know, you're going to need to cut out like, a chunk of time to, to come in and do all these recordings yeah. and sing the song. Um, we can promise, we can give you points on a back end if we decide to do a thing, but that's the best we can do. And my manager at the time was like, this is such a stupid movie. This is such a stupid movie. You can go on the road, you can make 25K in Texas right now, you know, this weekend, and you're, you're going you're gonna to cut out that to, for, for a couple hundred dollars and hope that it breaks goes makes over a certain amount so you can get back in she goes that's stupid and i'm like okay you're right and so i passed on the roll went to texas made my 25k the and movie that i passed on no, was no. happy feet no yeah i passed i was not fucking happy that next day no let happy me tell feet you, for you let me just tell your you feet right were not happy my feet were not happy <laughs> no, i what? passed on happy feet and who got the part they gave the part they didn't give the part but by the time they had raised the money. Uh, Robin Williams got the part, which I thought was like, you know what? If anybody's going to get it, my, ch my childhood hero I should mean, get that. So I thought that was cool. So he wanted to play. How long did it take you to have that type of energy? <laughs> it took me a minute because I was, I was good. <laughs> oh, and by the way, the movie, yeah, I can only imagine what the points and how much money I would have made because the movie, the movie made so much money they made a sequel. Oh, yeah, and so yeah. I would have gotten the sequel too. I'm guessing when you were saying my old manager... Was it because of reasons like this? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know what, though? I think that goes to show at the end of the day when you're really passionate about something and it's just something that you enjoy, sometimes, you know, the money that it's going to make you is just not worth it, you know? Because at the end of the day, you know you would have enjoyed that time. And, and, and that would have been part of the legacy. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, I, I would have been able to say, like, you know, I was in that movie. Like, wow, that was, you know, was, so many people have seen it. Uh, the second time it happened, because I want to share this one, uh, it was a movie called Planes, Disney, Planes. Mm. It was like their, their version their of cars, cars, cars for yeah, Planes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was playing the Mater character, the sidekick to the, the, main, the main character. Who played, yeah. who played M M Mater? was uh, Larry the Cable Guy. Got it. Yeah, and I think it was, was it Owen Wilson who played uh, Lightning McQueen? Did you get an audition for that? For, for Cars. Uh, for Cars, no. But for planes, yes. yes. And so I landed the, the, the side, the, the, the buddy character yeah. in that one. It's this, I forget the character's name. It was something, uh, it, was, it was a Spanish character. And so they, it, they required me to get a little, you know, si, sí, vamos a, you know, it was one yeah. of those voices. Yeah. And he's like, yes, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> you know, and so like, <laughs> we like this guy. It's good. Um, so they, they gave me the part. Uh, and they said, all right, cool. Well, we're going to need you uh, to do a table read for the executives. They want to they do a table read of the whole movie and have everybody there to voice the characters so that they can kind of, they can see it. And uh, I had work, I had obligations, you know, like to go on the road. And again, it was one of those things. Well, uh, and I'm telling them, I go, listen, guys, you said I got the part, but um, I, I got some work on the road. And I'm like, well, listen. We understand you got prior commitments. Don't worry. The part's yours. We'll just have somebody uh, read, read the part for you. Don't worry about it. You sure? Yeah, no problem. So, okay. So I go on the road. I do my thing. The person they had read for me is a voice actor named Carlos Elizraki. He's a, he's a, a comic, old, longtime friend. I've known him forever. <clears throat> the problem is Carlos Elizraki is next level with the voices. He's the guy that did the voice of the Taco Bell Chihuahua back in the day. Oh, yeah. Amongst other, I think Rocco's Modern World. He did so many characters. So you sent, you didn't just have a, a, a Joe Schmo read the line, read the, the, the part 
You sent in a freaking ringer. You brought in freaking, you know. The best. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like I'm a boxer. No, I got, yeah, well, we got Tyson to fill in for you. <laughs> yeah, what? Yeah, like, I don't so even want to come back. Why would you do you that? You brought in somebody who's, who's better at, at doing voiceovers than I am. <laughs> and so, That's a petty ass move. He goes in there and he slays it. He slays the table read. And they're like, who did we have in this thing? Yeah, no, they're not going to be better than this. And I agree. Freaking <laughs> no. Carlos killed it. So I lost the part because I wasn't there at that table read. I was on the road. And I was like, damn it, I did it again. The good part was that they still had other characters that needed to be, they needed other roles filled in that movie. And so they said, hey, look, we, know we can't give you the, 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 the side dude because, you know, Carlos got it now. But we're going to offer you these other parts. Did if you, you pass on it? it? No, I did it. Really? Yeah, oh, I said, I said, hey, I want to be part of the project. So, yeah, so I did the other characters that were smaller, you know, less lines, less everything. But I was still in the movie. But I remember like, oh, man, freaking car. And I told him to, I go, bro, I, I know you killed it in there. I know you killed it in there. What did you say? He was I, like, sorry. Yeah, it was, and, I, and I get it, yeah. you know. Yeah. My, Carlos, could you come fault, here real quick? I want to show you this ditch. For, for, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got to show you this ditch, Come dude. here, come here, Carlos. I want to see you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, he killed it. And again, you know, I, I, I missed out on a second opportunity like that for going on the road. So it's hard, the balance. But you know, doing voiceovers, for me, I, I love voiceover work more than regular acting in like in a TV show or movie. I love voiceover work. I just show up like this. Give me the mic. Let's do this. And yeah. we'll, all right. I don't have to memorize anything. Everything's right there. You got a director telling you, uh, speak higher, speak lower, make your voice, Ugh. you know, I need angrier, you know, and you're doing it instantly and it's instantly being done. Yeah. You're you know comfortable I mean? and you get to just play. Yeah. And then they have craft services right there. So you can, yeah, okay, I'm going to do this. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Sir, can we get another take without you eating? That would be great. <laughs> just one without food in your mouth. Yeah, That'd just, be awesome. Just one. Just, just one. No. Uh, my buddy actually plays one of the Ninja Turtles and uh, one of the Teen Titans. And he's like, yeah, come over to my one of my houses, by the way, because he's very, very established. And I came in, and he's in his robe with his coffee. He's like, one second, I'm finishing up work. And he walks into this tiny little booth. Booth, yeah. And he just like, me, 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 me. And he comes out, he goes, okay, I'm done. Let's go to the beach. And then I was like, are you kidding me, bro? I want this life, dude. This is sick. But So, so next to comedy, I like doing voiceover work. Comedy, second. Voiceover, voiceover work, and then, and then uh, acting. Makes sense yeah. because both of those kind of fall in the realm of you manipulating your voice. Surprised you never really jumped into podcasting. The reason why I didn't get into podcasting, because a lot of people have asked me, how come you didn't just start doing your own show? I feel like if you're going to have a successful podcast, you need to be consistent. You need to have a good schedule. You need to have people around you that are going to help you produce it. Because a lot of people think, oh, you just grab a mic and talk. No. You need to have people. If you're going to have a good podcast, you need people to help you produce it. The, the environment that you set up, you're going to have to have your topics that you're going to cover. And so that all takes work. It's a show. Yeah. And time. Yeah. It's a show. If yeah. you're going to do it right. If you're yep. just going to dick off and talk. And you know, and you could always come back to it. You yeah. could always go in the future and come but back to it. My whole thing was, I don't want to start something and half-ass it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't want to half-ass it because it's going to reflect on me. Oh, man, did you see a shitty podcast? Like, ugh, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm just saying, like uh, people, totally. I don't want people to say that about me. Yeah. Yeah. I would much rather be on someone else's show and then just it's a it's a hang. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this for me isn't work. It's a hang. We're hanging out. We're talking. This is fun. Yeah. I didn't have to get have anybody set all this stuff up. I didn't have to coordinate any of it. I just showed up and had fun and then I go back with the dogs and we're cool. Yeah. You totally. know, but yeah. if it's my show then I want to make sure I go back and I listen to it. All right, let's make sure that okay, how did they say that is this going to be okay? Let's go back and forth with the publicist. Make sure that the the the, the person we interviewed was comfortable with this. Make sure the follow-ups. It's a lot of work. Yeah. And if you're going to do it right, do it cool. Right. Yeah. But I knew already that I'm lazy with certain things that I'm like, eh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be as enthusiastic about it after, you know, a month. Mm -hmm. The first couple, I'll be like, this is cool, but I already know me and I know that I'm going to find something else that I'm going to want to do more than the podcast. Yeah. And it's then a, the podcast is going to turn into, though. it's going to turn into something that. Very reflecting of you. What? Well, I, because I, I, I know me. Yeah. And again, I don't want to start something I can't finish but it's good that you know that and therefore you're giving your audience good quality performances and content versus you're just trying to like phone over it in yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so would you ever write your own animation film create <gasps> your own character you had a netflix thing going on where you were a teacher yes i had the show as a, as a teacher but also there was a project that recently got uh freaking 86 because uh 
of, of you know, uh, changing of, of, of people over at Netflix. I had a, a deal with a, with a friend of mine. We were uh, doing an animated film uh, based on a, on, a, on a story that I had, I had given him about uh, my life and my son's life, kind of like a clashing of the two mm -hmm. lives together. And uh, it was going to be an animated film called I Chihuahua for Netflix. <laughs> and they, they picked it up. It was great. And then all of a sudden, Netflix went through this thing where people started getting let go and other people started coming in. And oh. each time somebody new would come in, they would make, make us redo the script. They didn't like it. Oy. And too so many they cooks make, in they, the kitchen. they'd start changing things. And it's like, and it happened too many times. And finally, you know, uh, they, it, was, it was one too many. Mm -hmm. And it's like, look, this is just not, it's no longer the thing that it should have yep, been. Yep, yeah. yep. And so now it's You're not going to so happen. You're so powerful. Why don't you just create something on your own and then sell it? Uh, that's also an option. Uh, that is such an option. For example, for you, bro. I have on online. I have the cartoons. I, I I hired this company in Colombia that does animation, really good animation, and I had them take all of my comedy uh, specials from the past yeah. and animate them, put them in cartoon form, cool. and, and, and break Very them up. Very Dane Cook. Did you get this from Dane Cook? This idea? I remember Comedy Central did that. Comedy okay, Central gotcha. was doing. Uh, they, I think they called them shorties, where yeah. they would take. Uh, comics bits and they would animate them. Cute. I'm so and surprised so, comics don't do more of that. It, it looks really cool. And it's it, gonna and blow it's, up on and TikTok. It's very much it, and so yeah. So I had this company do that. So it breaking up all my all my specials into these short form and call them fluffy bits. And so that's why we post that's them so and cute. stuff like that. So doing stuff like that is fun because it's still in the vein of my stand up. Anytime people like you for a certain thing and then you try to branch off, it's like, will this work here? Yep. You know? Okay, he's a funny comedian. Will he be a funny comedy actor on TV? The, well, does this box fit in this box? Okay, he's a funny uh, comedy actor on TV. Will that work on film? Can he be a funny, you know? So it's always like, can you take this and put it here? Will this work here? Will this mm. work here? And I feel like animation, uh, animating comedy bits should fit, should work. People, it, it, you would think, people like cartoons, people like stand-up, combine the two, especially if they're a fan of the person. So it's a visual I do uh, pay and, and, and produce my own animated stuff, which is all, uh, all that to say that. I love that. that you know, I can't but wait to watch it. as far as doing a movie, that's, that takes a lot more. It's a bigger project. Yeah, it's a bigger project. <laughs> and because of the fact that people can just do this to you, you know, it's so easy, it's kind of, it's, it's discouraging and scary at times. I think you need to take advantage of the modern technology on the fact that this is no longer a thing for somebody like Fluffy. This should never be anything for you, bro. You, you, dude, dude, you sold out Dodgers State. Who the fuck? I'm sorry. I'm trying to not swear. But who has the ability to do this to you? Go fuck yourself. What do you mean? Go, you go sell out Dodger Stadium and then tell me what's good or not. You know what I mean? Like to me, it's like I can't even fathom that you waited for well, somebody. If, to... if, well, if, if I want to produce something on my own and put it out on my own platform, on my own YouTube or my own you know, website or whatever, I can do that. That's always an option. But if you want to be uh, like I want if, if I'm going to do a movie, I want it in a theater or I want it on the biggest streaming platform because there is something to be said about having having your project on, you know, like I have Netflix specials. Yeah. I don't have specials, specials that are online, you know, because like you're looked at a certain way. If you if you release your special by yourself, some people say, oh, well, I guess his special wasn't good enough to be on Amazon or Netflix. And he just told, mm -hmm. chose to do it on his own unless you do something like a Louis C.K. where he wound up actually making more money by producing it himself. But yeah. You know, it's like, uh, what happened? How come he's no longer on that? So it's kind of a, a thing where people are like, okay, I guess he's going down now. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and that's, that's part of it, too. And that's dangerous because it's an image thing, and you've worked so hard to... To maintain that. And, and so... This image that you've built, and I've, I'm looking around... Uh, what would you even call this? Like a factory? Or what, would, what would you... It's a compound. It's a compound. This huge compound. I'm seeing Marvel. I'm seeing WWE. Did any of these influence you on how to portray Fluffy and bring Fluffy into a bigger realm like did you take from their ideas like were you inspired by wwe or were you just a fan of it i'm a huge fan of wrestling i'm a huge fan of wwe and i've uh, modeled a lot of what i do after professional wrestling because i'm such a huge fan and i just love the lights i love the show i love the environment i love the excitement i love the products yeah the merch all of that is is like this like wow it's it's so cool all the way around 
and I love the details. I love the details and the quality of the product is so high. And I did, in fact, when I started doing my shows, I will spend extra money so that my stage looks like a special. It doesn't just look like, oh, they just built the stage, they gave him the microphone, there's a curtain, now he's doing his thing. No, man, I have production. I tell people my show is WWE meets the Food Network. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. and by it's, the way, your stadium, <clears throat> sorry, for Dodgers, uh, for your Dodgers show, it looked, your stage looked so beautiful. I love your logo of you going like this. Like, it looks so good with your palm trees. You did an incredible job. Money well spent. Did you see that? She yeah, reacted? no, because yeah. as soon as you walked out, I was like, oh, I you, love it. And you want to make people feel like the money that they spent, that, yeah. you know, you're showing. Wow, look at this, you yeah. know? Yeah. And, and so I definitely, uh, I have no problem spending money on making my show look better. I know I'm going to go out there and give the best freaking comedy show I can give. But they're not just there, you know, uh, I'm not there for the entire experience, you know. I'm not there walking in the front door seeing this. I'm not there sitting down early on, you know. Like, the people are still in that environment, and so you want to give them as much, you know, as you can. At least I do. And I, I feel that way when I go to wrestling events. When I'm at a wrestling event, I'm like, man, I got all the lights, and there's all kinds of stuff. We got the screens, and the intros are always big and loud, and... You know, there's 20 different T-shirts I can buy. Oh, man, I, God, this is cool. Uh, uh, coffee mug, like a keychain. Like, you know, I liked all of that. And so I said, man, I go, this is working. The lines are long for the merch. Yeah. And I think that a lot of times uh, comics miss the boat on that. There's like, you can, you can definitely do a whole nother business. You know, if you got people there that are already supporting you and they're already invested in what you do, you know, they're just going to help promote you more. If you put a, a try it, put a T-shirt out there, see, see what happens. Um, early on, all I sold were CDs. Oh, yeah. And my buddy Martin goes, dude, you got to start selling T-shirts. I'm like, why am I going to sell a T-shirt, Martin? I go, the CD cost me 75 cents to make. I sell it for 20 autographed. Yeah, stupid and Martin. It's, <laughs> it's 75 cents. I go, a T-shirt cost me 450 to make, and I'd sell it for 20 I go, I'm losing money on that in my in my yeah. mind he yeah. goes yeah but people want t-shirts more than they want cds i go no they don't <laughs> try it you fucking right <laughs> You You're eating right. a red lobster He's today, Martin. Right. <laughs> Listen, if you have That's a friend right. who's like giving you money ideas, He's right. it's a good friend. <laughs> and then, but then once I, but then once I started doing the 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 merch, I wanted the merch to be of the highest quality. I didn't want janky, hokey, freaking, you know, the shirts feeling all rough or being cut off weird. Or, but I, I forget the the brand that everybody would use. The real cheap. Uh, I, I don't want to throw nobody under the bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, 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 no. But, beep, just, just, beep. Yeah. but um, I know exactly what you're talking about. Because when mm -hmm. I did my merchandise, they were like, this is what everybody's using. And I felt it. I go, well, I wouldn't wear this. And they said, well, no, this is, the, this is where you'll make the most money. And I said, well, that's also holding my brand on it. I can't put my name on something that I wouldn't wear. I feel like I'm robbing you. If I do that, then that means I'm lying to you, saying that I would wear this when I wouldn't wear this. So you have a lot of respect when it comes to your art. And I yeah. think that's why you're, you're very where you're at. And, and also, too, like... I wanted the best of the best so that everything I'm putting out there, even if, I'm, even if I could make more money by using cheaper things, I didn't want that. I wanted to be compared to. Like when people come out to the shows, they're like, wow, this is like wrestling. Mm. The show is big. Merch lines are long. People are excited. It's an environment. There's families. Yeah. They, like, I love that people compare my show to wrestling. Mm. Like it's a thing. Everybody that walks out on stage has an intro video that plays as they're walking out. You know, everybody comes out to big music and lights and movement, you know, and then I come out and it's all big old freaking like, oh, my God, it's like, ah, it's like wrestling. So, yes, very much. I, 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 I liked what they were doing and I wanted to, to do that. And so, you know, getting the, the paying for a really good artist to design my stuff, paying for a really good artist to, you know, create either, you know, the original logo, which took went in so many different directions to get it to where it is now. And, and then being able to uh, create products and stuff and, and, and build these relationships with companies like Funko. Funko was one of those things where like now I sell Funko Pops on the road, but oh, yeah. we, I had to establish that relationship. But they needed to see that my brand was a certain level for them to want to work with me. Same thing with like Tapatio or any of these other brands that like Volkswagen, they needed to see that I was at a certain place for them to go, okay, 
And you do that by investing in yourself, spending the money, make sure you're giving the most quality possible. And yes, you can save money. Yes, you can use cheaper things. But in the long run, you know, spend the money, put out good quality stuff, and then watch as people will gravitate towards that. Yeah. You know, people want to make that quick money right now. No one's willing to take the time to pl plant the seed. No one wants to plant the seed. They the already want game. the whole tree. Yeah. They don't want the long game. Mm -hmm. They want the money right now. Yeah. Nobody and, wants um, to plant the seed because not a lot of people dug the ditch. Look at that. Whoa. Look at that full circle right there. I love that. I'm going to take yeah. a sip. <laughs> and so before we get started. Um, <laughs> Seriously. What a callback. But I love that you care so much about your audience and you treat them how you would want to be treated. You're like, what would I want at a show? And you give that for them, which I think is wonderful. I, you know? The first time I ever did comedy, uh, Joe Coy made me open up for him. He was like, you got to come on stage. And I'm like, bro, like, I don't even know. I've never wrote a joke in I my life. I love Joe. Joe's, he's got such a big heart. My mom and dad, like. So much energy. Opens the door. <laughs> he would come to our house after a show. I'm not exaggerating. Three o'clock in the morning, my mom's making full dinner for him and everybody on his team. We're hanging out. And he is, without a doubt, one of the most kind-hearted human beings I've ever met in my life. And uh, before I left and he, I, I was starting to learn from him, he, he said, look at me and, and, and promise me this. He goes, never sell a ticket unless you know for a fact they'd buy it again. He goes, because once you sell a ticket, that nobody would want to buy again. He goes, the word of mouth of not buying your ticket, it's forever. He goes, people will not go to your shows. So I had my first show last year. It was like a podcast stand-up thing. And everybody on the way out, because I did a free meet and greet where I gave everybody a hug, on the way out, they all said, I can't wait for the next one. I can't wait for the next one. And I thought it's because, truly, I listened to him when he mm. said, do not ever go out and just try to make a dollar. And I think a lot of people in my shoes... I call myself the spoiled celebrity, right? Because I came from social media and it was like given to me. I didn't truly earn it at the level of these other comics that were out there putting stuff on, on windshields. Cars, to get, yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? And I know that. So I don't want to disrespect anybody. And I, and I truly put in that time to make sure that I'm in your guys' industry. And I, I want to make sure you guys know that I really do respect this craft and I'm putting in the hours that I'm doing. Uh, but one time, right before I went on stage for the first time, he looks at me and goes, I want you to, this will always make you feel better. When you go out there, know this deep in your heart. When you go out there, good or bad, never forget. They will forget you immediately when they see me. And I go, okay, dude. What the fuck? <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. Like, that's some good legs to stand on. <laughs> good or bad, they'll forget you. They will forget you. I was like, okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have anybody take you on stage and mentor you? Oh my God, that's hysterical. That's that's Joe all day. Uh, we have like a bromance. We we we've been hanging out so much. Uh, we went to go see uh, you two at the Sphere. <laughs> really? You two? You two? You know the group? You know, the band. You two. With or without Bono? Everybody has that on their phone. When you buy your phone, there's already you two downloaded to your Apple oh, Music. Oh, that those guys? How do you they do that? Because because they're you two. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, we went to go see them at the, in Vegas at the Sphere, which if anybody gets a chance to see a show at the Sphere, it's an incredible experience. It's, you know, you're immersed in it. You're, it's, it's a screen that, that maxes out your peripheral vision. Wow. So it's the screen just, in, you're engulfed. The only thing that I can compare it to would be like if you're wearing VR goggles. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was about to say, <clears throat> did you try the Apple ones yet? Not yet. Because I'm scared that I'm going to like it too much and I'm going to want to spend my life in there. I feel like it would be addicting, and I'm afraid of, of like, I'm, I want to enjoy this life. I don't want to go and, and, you know. Did you Were you ever addicted to any video games or anything like that? Early on, Nintendo and stuff like that, but, you like know. The, like the, that, that one? That was me. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I maxed out at, the, at blowing the cartridge. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's I, it right Those there. are the best games, honestly. Hey, did you ever, it. like, put toothpaste on a CD? Have you guys ever done that? Toothpaste? It's it's a it's a thing. Yeah, it's to a thing. To fill the cracks, the scratches. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh it's gosh. a thing. Uh, but, but yeah, anyway, back to the Joe Coy for a second. Uh, incredibly nice human being. He's very genuine, which is hard to find yeah. in this industry. And I'm I'm lucky to call him a friend. And I'm excited that we have the same team. So, his manager's my manager. Oh yeah. His agent, my agent. Yeah. Promoter, my promoter. So we have the same people around us. So it's nice because. You know, uh, there's trust there, and you feel comfortable. 
Mm. And that's that's pretty awesome. And you know, the level he's at, man, I love it when he he crashes my shows and then I'll crash his show. So like, you know, it, it, and I think the, the way awesome he speaks that, about you is incredible, man. Like truly incredible. Like that man loves you. Like fully, not because of your success of who you are as a human being. And I'm very happy that you guys have each other because it's tough to be in this industry and be lonely because sometimes you want to get excited and talk about something. And sometimes to your, uh, to friends that are not in the industry, it seems like you're bragging or, yes. or, or like flexing on that, them, but you're like, it was an obstacle that they didn't understand that you had to go through, but your friend will dap you up and be like, yeah, I understand what you're going through. I'm really happy you have that. Are you, are you close with Tiffany Haddish? He's super close with Tiffany Haddish. They're, they're, they're homies, man. They're yeah. buddies. They grew up together. Um, Do you they, have anybody like that? In the, in my buddy Martin, you know, I mean, uh, the thing with me is that once I started working and going on the road, I stayed on the road. And so unfortunately I didn't, I wasn't able to branch out and build all these relationships here at home because I was always out. I was always gone. So I wasn't able to get into certain circles because I wasn't around. And I feel like uh, that's why the relationship I have with my friend Martin and anybody around me is so strong because we've been on the road together for so many years. So many years. That's so cool. You guys get to but share I, so many memories. Yeah, with one but uh, as, as far as like, you know, anybody like that, no, man. It's, I thought it was cool that he brought Tiffany to my show. I was like, oh, my God, you're here. You know, and I remember <laughs> Tiffany from back, back in the day, at, you know, at the Laugh Factory and stuff. Um, but I didn't have anybody that, that I was coming up with, yeah. you know, because I was, I was already gone. And what, what was your first, like, break? Like, where you're like, oh, shoot, this is really going to spin me in a different direction. Uh, I did a television show called Que Locos uh, back in the early 2000s. And it was a show that was... It was the like Latino version of, of Def Jam, basically, if if that makes sense. It yeah. was it was Music a show. Related? It was a show that 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 showcased new new up and coming talent. Got it. Canadians, yeah. But it was all it was very Latin driven. So everybody was you know people of color on the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was on this network called Galavision, Galavision, and Galavision. It's a Spanish network, so everything's in Spanish. It's soccer games, it's boxing, it's soap operas. Everything's in Spanish. I watch this every day, but actually. This comedy show was on the network, and it was in English, and so it was the weirdest thing because the network didn't have a lot of of, of original programming to put up. The comedy show was their show, so they would run the shit out of that show all day. That show would air. Once they had a, a bunch of episodes, they'd air it two, three times per day. Wow. And so people would always, like, it, it was just there, you know? And this is before all the YouTube and all that stuff. So if you're surfing through the, you know, the, 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 uh, all the channels, plus they ran ads for the, you know, like, don't forget to miss our, you know, catch the show, blah, blah, blah. And then we did a Que Locos tour, and they were, they were promoting the tour, and they would promote it three, four times an hour. So you were and always so on people's screens. I was always on the screen. And so that's what got my face out there. Nice. And, and I was able to build off of that because we'd go to these markets where before I was doing a comedy club and with radio and promotion and, and really promoting it, I could sell tickets. But man, being on one commercial from that show, we were able to sell out theaters. Whoa. Yeah. So that was the huge first jump right there. And I already had a Comedy Central special under my belt at that point. And that Comedy Central special only got me credibility to get booked, but it didn't automatically equal tickets. This show equaled tickets. Right. Because people have been watching you. They've been watching you, yeah. <clears throat> They know what you're about. They want to come see you. Yeah. So That's great. For, I would love to walk through this, right? I want to know the first time you sold out the club, theater, and stadium. Because all three are like, I know they're significantly different ticket sales. But to the heart, it's like a, it's the same thing. Like you achieved something you worked for. Do you remember these days? Yeah, well, I remember the club. The club was in Texas, El Paso, Texas, for some reason. We're back to Texas again. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I sold out a, a comedy club uh, called The Comic Strip in El Paso. And I, re I remember hearing stories about Carlos Mencia uh, selling tickets. And they're like, yeah, Mencia, he, he walked out of here with 25 k he walked out of here with 25K, uh, and I'm like, that just blew my mind. Like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, because at the time, I was a comic making, what, uh, as a feature, $500 for the week. Um, 
So and how many to, nights to be a comic? So yeah, that's like five shows, night? like five shows. Yeah, as a feature, and to hear that somebody could make twenty five thousand, like, <laughs> oh my god! Like I'd only have to do one show a year, <laughs> 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 or one one week. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so uh, I remember when I when I finally you know got a, a door deal and get a door deal, and the, it was all negotiated, and I had I had made uh, seventeen thousand dollars. The entire weekend was sold out at, wow. at, the, at the club. And I was just like, wow. <laughs> and I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm just, I just stared at the check. And I'm just like, this is insane. How many this people could I invite to Red Lobster? Nice. <laughs> oh, and oh, believe me, I, I did. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> you I don't did. forget about your people. And I think that's why it hurts you when they try to throw you with the guilt. Because you're like, dude, you have no idea. I can't what stand I the guilt trips, man. It's, it sucks. Yeah. Man. It sucks. And, and I, I hate disappointing. I hate telling people no. It, it's, you know. It breaks your heart because you want to do everything. You want, because you provide laughter and smile. Your goal is to make you, when you walk in, I want you to be happier now and then leave. That's, you're like the doctor of laughter, right? So when your own loved ones are looking at you and they know who you are and then they say that, two things happen. One, you go, do you even know who I am? You've seen me do this for strangers. You know what I do for my family. And you're accusing me to be something I'm not. That breaks you. Because then you're like, okay, are you here for the wrong reasons? Am I, am I uh, a mirage now at this point? And then the second thing is, okay, now, now I've learned I can't do this for somebody. And then that also hurts because there's a lot of joy you do when you set somebody up for success. Like I'll never forget that Joe Coy was the one that brought me on stage. I will always give him credit for that. And I look forward to doing something successful so I could go out and be like, Joe, look what I did when you gave me that opportunity. And I'd appreciate if somebody plays ball with me that way, but when they don't, it hurts me. There's only one thing that fixed my positioning on that thought was God. Because my mom looked at me and she goes, hey, is, say your friend breaks your heart like three times in a row. How many times have you asked God for forgiveness on the same thing that you promised him you wouldn't do? And you, you know your heart. You didn't mean to do that, but your surroundings and your emotions made you lead to make that decision. So show them grace and know that God blessed you this way because he knows you could handle this type of life. And so when somebody else fails you in your eyes, you shouldn't look at them being like, look what you're trying to do to me. The sad truth is, look what you're doing to yourself, man. Because I know you're doing this to me. You're going to be doing this to other people. And people catch on. Mm. We just got deep. I'm so Yeah, sorry. no, I felt that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I felt that. Um, before we wrap up, I got to talk about a magical place, and it's Disneyland. Okay. And I know you're part of the 33 Club. I am, uh, I am not part of the 33 Club, but I am really good friends with someone who is. Got it. Club 33, though, is very exclusive, and you can't just walk in there. You can't just walk in there. It, it requires a membership. It requires... Uh, people uh, a waiting list to get on you gotta there's a whole process just to be able to go in there the reason i brought it up is because the dining experience there is crazy but have you had the chef's table the chef's table no mm. haven't had the chef's table can we please explain you're to you you're gonna the chef be so excited my friend calls me up so i okay Two times I've been to Disneyland, that was like really amazing. It was one, I went with the Disney star. So they go and they give you that treatment. And in my mind, I go, this is the best you could get at Disneyland. There's no way they're going to treat you better than this. Well, I have a freak friend named AJ, and he has nothing to do with Disney, and he's not in the industry at all. But my God, this man will hunt for like the best deals, the best coupons, the best situations. So he's sitting there, and he calls me. He goes, we just got <laughs> the chef's table. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll like split this with you. He goes, it's 2500 And I go, I'm sorry, what? And he goes, yeah, it's 2500 but he goes, I'm telling you, bro, like, you're going to love this. It's going to come with this room and this and this. I'm like, all right, it's an experience. I like experiences, especially dinners. I love to do this. Let's try it. And mind you, for this reservation, he had to, you can only, to get the reservation, you have to wait for a certain call that happens like once a year and you have to call at midnight. To get the, and there's only like one that you can get or two you can get. You have to be that phone there's call. There's two tables. So if you don't get it, you don't get it. <laughs> so he gets it. And I didn't know how big of a deal this was. We get there, we sit down. It's a five course meal. You get no menus. The chef comes up to you and he just sits there. He's like, oh, Fluffy, tell me about yourself. And you start talking and he goes, okay, I know, shh, enough. And then I'll talk to somebody else. Okay, continue, tell me, tell me about yourself. And he's like, oh, shh. And then I'll go to the next one. And then we get five meals that are perfectly for us. And it, it blew my mind. It was 
the most magical wow. dinner I've ever been at a part Club of. Club 33. No, no, it was at, it's at Disney, but it, it's not about not. It has nothing to do with Club Thirty Three. I was just going to compare it because I thought maybe you've done both. I wanted to know the name what, of the place is the Chef's Table, or no, no, it's no, called the, the Chef's Table. Yeah, no, 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 the experience is the Chef's Table, but the restaurant I think is called something Rose. But the rest, the restaurant is next to the uh, California Hotel. Yeah. So you know the big California Hotel that's attached to the California side of things. Right. It's the, the restaurant's like attached to that hotel, and it's called I think it's Rose. I don't know what it's called. You gotta, you gotta tell me what. The, yeah, yeah. Asher will so, look it up. So the we'll reason I brought this up is uh -huh. if I could magically, if possibly, get that table, would you have dinner with me there? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm already trying to book this. I'm like, that's, that's why I'm asking questions. I'm like, it was so, no, but seriously, like, see? Hey, 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 by the way, and by the way, uh, and by the way, this is why I can't lose weight. Uh, <laughs> see what I'm talking about? It's hard. <laughs> he heard me crying like I can't just food and this and that, and now and he's just contributed. That's why. So we'll sorry, lift people. weights afterwards. Yeah, well, sure. Yeah, yeah. We'll yeah, talk yeah, about okay. it. We'll bring your scooters we'll, and we'll, we'll talk walk about the it. park. No, yeah, we'll yeah, bring we'll the scooter. I ain't walking that park. That's too big. Well, I do want to know because I saw there were some speculations online. I saw an article that came from uh, January 2024 that said that you were thinking about retiring after this tour. Is that something that you're still considering? I had said it because I really felt like, you know, I had jumped the shark after Dodger Stadium. I'm like, I'm on the other side of it now. Because yeah. how do you, what do you do then? You know, like, what's the next goal? How do you, you know, most people will never achieve that yeah. in life. And to, like, I felt like for me, when I did Dodger Stadium, I'm like, you know, if I was to die tomorrow, there's the movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? But like, okay, so now we did it. Now what are we going to do? Like, oh, my God. We're, we're literally on the other side. I'm on the other side. of the, I peaked out. Now I'm on the other end. So I'm like, what else can I bring to the table? You know what I mean? And so, like, I'm very, if I need a goal. I need to be uh, something to work towards. Have you found it yet? You know, uh, I, have. Okay. I have. I have found the, the next goal. Are we, are we allowed um, to know? Uh, I'll tell you in a second, but. I've, I've struggled with that whole idea of retiring just because I feel like I've worked so much and I spend so much time on the road and I'm away from, from this. I'm away from friends. I'm away from family. I'm away because I'm out working. I'm enjoying it, but it's also taxing. Yeah. Um, and I said, you know what? I've, I think I've done very well for myself and let's go enjoy the fruits of the labor. You know what I'm saying? Amen. And so I did, I did say it. I even said it on stage. I'm like, I think this is, you know, but the problem is I still love it. I still yeah. love it, and and you're I'm, young. I, and and but I'm also afraid of of going stale. I'm afraid of people seeing the show and going, you know what? Uh, he's not as funny as he used to be. Uh, it's not as you know. I don't want people getting a watered down version mm. of the show. So I need to, you know, con that's why I'm still like, okay, we got to go do more shows. We got to do this. We got to do that. Go in this angle. Go in that angle. Try something different. You know, in wrestling, it's called a. Uh, uh, when, when people start fizzling out and they're good guys, they do this thing called a heel turn where all of a sudden I was a good guy. Now I'm a bad guy. So I feel like I still have that in, in my thing where as a comic who doesn't get political, doesn't get controversial, doesn't get in certain veins, certain topics. There's a lot of things I shy away from because I don't want to ruffle feathers because I want to have people that come out and, and, and I want to bring people together, not divide people. You know, so I've, uh, people know that that's, that's the show that I do. I bring people together. But if I ever get to a place where I, I feel like, you know, if, if I could ever do anything different to reinvent myself, you know, there could be a thing where maybe all of a sudden now I, I have a real strong opinion about things. I versus... said this to you when we were, le you came out of the elevator and you said, hey, I'm excited about the show. And the first thing I said to you after watching you perform, I said, hey, man. I could hear a lot of your opinions. Are you going that direction? And like, was very excited about that because you did it in such a funny way and it was lighthearted. But I could tell all your perspectives are now being shown. That's a cool thing because I get it. Okay, so the heel turn is you're doing this and if, God forbid, they say, oh, he's being too like this, that's your character switch. But you're actually just trying to show people what's in your heart I'm, at a I'm, different level. I'm really trying to, yeah. So I'm, I'm putting out there like stuff that's like, whoa, shoot. Whoa, yeah. But... I'm, the, the, the trick is to be able to do it in a comedic way. People are still getting the laughs. People are still getting the show. And it's not coming across preachy or, you know, here's the agenda, you know. Yeah. But I'm, I'm telling these stories where I'm letting people know more about me. Like, 
like the stuff that we would talk about if we go get a drink. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, like, oh, I got an opinion. I'll tell you. I try not to put that out there. So the the reinventing part is starting to introduce mm-hmm. real opinions into the show, but do it in a way that do it in the style that I've been doing it. You feel like you're finally trying, ready to share that part of you and be more vulnerable and open? I think so. Uh, there was a joke but, you but, said that I thought about a lot. I don't want to say it now because it might be a material that you're working on for the future, but there was one thing you said. I'll beep it out so we could just, like, cover it. But it was... Ah, yes. That, to me, I thought about it every day since you said that because I was like, damn, I never thought about it from that point of view. That could be so demotivating and annoying. But then I also was thinking about me being a Syrian and nobody even knowing who I was. So like, I was like, I wish somebody even knew what my people were. I'm excited to see your new work. I'm very am. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be recording a new special in July. And uh, yeah, so wow. how do you top that last show that I did? There is no topping that particular show. That's a one and done. I'll never do Dodger Stadium again nor do I want to do it again. It's special because I did it once, yeah. Yeah. you know? So I'm, I'm grateful that it happened and best night of my life. Uh, for me to want to stay excited and want to continue to be a comic, I definitely needed to start introducing new ideas into the show. And this new special, I think you heard some of the material already. It's like, mm-hmm. It's spicy. <laughs> it's, it's got a, little, it's got a little, little tang on it. And I don't know how people are going to receive it, but I think it's one of those things where You know, along this road, you have people that, you know, get on the bus and people that get off the bus. And fortunately, more people are getting on the bus than getting off. And I think as long as there's growth, you know, because every day I'm I'm monitoring social media and I'm looking at numbers. And it always shows you how many new followers you have, but it also shows you how many people unfollowed you. And that was like, ooh, really? What did I do to them? (laughs) You know, what did I post that led to that? But then it's like, but you see the new follows and... As long as the new followers are bigger than the unfollows, I think you're okay. Yeah. Well, and, I can't wait uh, to see that side of you. So this, and this see next, material. yeah, this next it's special great. is it's great. It's going to be, you know. I, I have to say, I think it's from what I watched you do on Joe's stage, it was one of my favorite materials you've done. Because I felt like you were literally peeking back the curtain and letting us be able to see from your point of view instead of that story that you're telling. Like, you know what I mean? It, it's a. Uh, I'm excited for you. I'm excited for that second mountain for you to climb. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you um, for sharing. And uh, I can't wait for us to do this one more time. And go to the Disney dinner. Food. Yes. Yep. Food. <laughs> thank you.